Amen. Good morning. I hope everybody had a great Christmas and a happy new year. The, uh, if you were unable to be with us, we had three incredible Christmas Eve services, um, literally packed the room three times, and the nativity out front, um, all of you that, that donated and helped and uh, sacrificed for that, we thank you for that, and that'll be a, a huge blessing for time to come. Also, on, we, we gave out on last Sunday, if you did not get them, we gave out two cards, one for the Old Testament, one for the New Testament, Bible reading cards so that you can have a daily reading plan, how to go through the scripture in a year. If you didn't get them, they're out on the welcome table, so please stop by and, and grab one of those. And uh, I, I'll just repeat what I repeated last Sunday. If, if, if I had my rather of whether you came to church or read your Bible every day, read your Bible every day. Okay, and you say, ooh, that's a dangerous statement for a preacher to make, but it's the truth. I would rather you feed on God's word every single day. Um, you'll grow more um, from that. And, and so I want to jump into a brand new series today um, called That's a Great Question. And uh, it really is important because we, we're living in a time where we're becoming more and more and more polarized, especially when it comes to faith especially when we get there. And, and we often look at it like, you know, people on the left, they, they, we, we kind of think of them, they're, they're, they're those people that live in the middle of the country, right, that, 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 that literally they cling to God, they cling to their guns because they're afraid of what's going to happen. They're often judgmental, that's what people say. And then those on the right that often complain about elitist cultural gatekeepers, often in the media or in academia, and, and, and folks, we, we, we seem to, they seem to be disproportionately secularist and often hostile to faith. But, but I would just say to you this. We live in a fabulous part of the world. I mean, right here in Berkeley County. And, and, and here's why I say that. We, we absolutely have a, a, a commitment. And I've, I've been here now for 23 years in Berkeley County. And I've watched the educational commitment of our community go from here to up here. It's, it's got better and stronger and increased Every year that I've been here, I mean, amazingly so. In fact, 22 years ago when you did the demographic study, educational levels were below high school graduate. I mean, it was, it was an amazing thing. And it's now that you've got a little bit of college as the average person that's around. And, 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 and you, I'm just saying this, we love education. We love technology and with that. But I would tell you that there's some on the other side of that spectrum when we, we, we look at that, they assume that being a person of faith, that, listen, you have to check your brains at the door. Come on, y'all, you understand what I'm talking about, right? You, you, that, that, that you cannot be a, a thoughtful person, you can't be a discerning person, you can't be somebody that really is serious about truth. And so I want to uh, kind of kick off this series called That's a Great Question because I want to be a, a church and you've heard me say this before, but I want to I be a church where it's okay to be cynical. It's okay to come with hard, honest questions and doubts. And listen, where everybody's welcomed in that, it's okay to ask your questions. We act like we don't have them. Listen, I'm the pastor of the church. I have doubts and skepticism all the time. You know, a church needs to be a place where you can come honestly and openly, and we should always embrace the truth. Amen? I mean, even if it's found somewhere outside the church, we should embrace it. We should look at it. And so I, I want to just simply say this, that our model for being open like that is Jesus. Some of you would say, well, that's kind of shocking. No, Jesus was often confronted with people. One time, a man came to him with his son. You, you probably remember the story. He had his boy. And, 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 and Jesus said, do you believe? He said, yes, I, I believe, but... No, I don't. Help my unbelief. Right? I mean, he was skeptical. He, he, he doubted another time one of his 12, Thomas, had doubts about his resurrection. I don't believe it. I'm not sure unless it, this, you know. And, and listen, when it all came down, Jesus appeared to the, to the disciples. And do you remember? It says, the scripture says this. It says they worshipped him, but some doubted. You haven't ever heard that preached on, have you? They worshipped him, but some doubted. I, I think that, that we need to understand, we, we all get there at times, but Jev, Jesus never once said to somebody that doubted, you're done, get out. You're out of here. And so what we're going to do is for the next seven weeks, we're going to 
look at the questions, and you can put that cell up of the, 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 the different messages in the series. And, and, and I'm going to talk today about is Christianity irrational. Next week we'll talk about is Christianity anti-woman. I'm a little bit scared of that one, by the way. And is the Bible pro-slavery? Is Christianity intolerant of other faiths? Is God anti-sex? Why does God allow so much suffering? And can you believe in the Bible and science? And so today we want to tackle that question. Is faith irrational? What do you say? How do you deal with people? Is faith irrational when we get there? I mean, is it possible to believe deeply in reason and logic and learning, but also embrace faith in the miraculous and a supernatural God? Can you, is, it, is there room for both? Is there a place? And, and I think it's important. And there's four really common ideas that when I share these, you're going to say, yeah, I hear that all the time. And that there are four common ideas. And I'm going to tell you, I think there are four misconceptions, okay? Four misconceptions. And the very first one is faith actually means believing good things for no reason. Faith actually means believing good things for no reason. Archie Bunker once said, faith is something that you believe that nobody in his right mind would believe. Now, we can kind of think about that and do it, but, but listen, that, that, that misconception is quite widespread. It's quite all over the place. Harvard professor Steven Pinker put it like this. He says, universities are about reason, pure and simple. Faith, believing something without good reasons to do so, has no place in anything but a religious institution. You know, I heard somebody that works in, in universities say that if you think that what happens in university boardrooms and directors' meetings is all about pure reason, you're crazy. They don't make their decisions like that. They don't function like that. And so what I want to do is I want to focus on that definition of faith as believing things without a good reason. Because an idea, idea behind that is faith means believing whatever authorities tell you. You know, in other words, the pastor stands up and he pours it into your head and you just have to accept it without reason involved. That's what, what, what many believe faith is, whereas reason means believing what the evidence tells you regardless of what the authorities tell you. And so I want to start by just put it, pointing out for the first three centuries of the church, right? The first three, you know, there was no authority structure. There wasn't that overarching place in the church, but the church it, it saw this expansion, this spontaneous expansion of the church. And so Christianity did not grow because authority was behind it. Often it grew because authority was opposed to it. Is everybody with me on this? You know, and let, me, let me just run through real simple, and we've talked about this before, but it grew from around 1,000 Christians in A.D. 40 to maybe 10,000 by the year 100 to maybe 200,000 by AD 200, to maybe five or six million a century after that. Staggering growth. Staggering. I mean, when you start swept across, it literally it was crazy. But how did it happen? It wasn't because you had authority saying you have to believe this stuff. You've got to. It was just the opposite. They were Standing through it. But I want you to get a glimpse into the growth. Look at the book of Acts with me real quick. Here, here, here's one pl passage. It says, so Paul reasoned. I want you to get that word, reasoned. He reasoned. He, he didn't say he preached. It says he reasoned. And where did he do it? It says he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks. Those are the religious people. But then it says, as well as in the marketplace. He didn't just do it in church. He did it out in the community. He did it at his workplace in the thing. And, and then it says day by day with those who happened to be there. So it wasn't just a, a one-time thing. It was every day. It was part of his life as, as he was going on. And he says a group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers. You might highlight those things. Epicure, Epicurean and Stoic philosophers, they began to debate with him. And some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Well, who were these Epicureans and the Stoics? They were the intellectuals of the day. I mean, if we hear of an Epicurean, we tend to think of some kind of gourmet food today, an Epicurean delight, right? Well, but, but actually, they were among the very early believers of a common notion that's just simply this, the claim that physical reality is all there is. 
It's just physical. There is nothing other than atoms. We would call that physicalism uh, today. One of their sayings went like this. There's nothing to fear in God. Why? Because there is no supernatural. There's nothing to feel in death. There is no afterlife. Good pleasure can be attained. Evil pain can be endured. That's what life is about. And then there were the Stoics. And the Stoics, they gave preeminent place to reason and logic above emotion. And, 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 and they, in other words, they believed in self-mastery. If I can order my private world, if I could have my thoughts and my actions in order, that's the ultimate in human flourishing. But, but Paul and many others, like Paul, had this conversation in, in the marketplace of ideas, and Christianity did not, did not grow by avoiding rational conversations. You know, it grew because they were willing to take on the truth, to take on the facts, and, and, and let the facts prove out our faith, prove out the truth. And, and we're going to talk more about that. And so Christianity's explanation of life, in other words, how did we get here? What's the human condition? What's the purpose of life? It, it, it literally together with a community of unprecedented love. In other words, that the, listen, the, the, they, they started teaching that all of humanity is to come together as one in a community that's like no other, that everybody is supposed to be of equal worth. That everyone is valuable, that, they, that there is actually solid grounds for what we're believing. You know, the, 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 the truth is digging it down. And what happened was, here was this truth that came into the community, and it overwhelmed this first century world as they saw this community that loved each other, but they did it on truth and on basis and on reason. And, and, and listen, all the power of Rome, all the education of Rome, all the money. I mean, Rome was known as the wisdom place of the world. They couldn't hold back this church. It exploded right there in their face. Why? Because it was built on reason. It was built on truth. And it's worth noting, folks, Listen, do you realize that, that all the first universities that came into this world were all Christian universities? Did you know that? I mean, when you start looking at that, they, they, were, they were founded to, to foster Christian belief and reason and logic. That is why they were started. In fact, the, 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 when, when you look at that, the motto of Oxford University to this day is, listen, the Lord is my light. It was taken from the book of Psalms. The Lord is my light. It's still their motto to this day. You know, 92% of the very first 138 colleges and university, all Christian. 92% who came into existence by followers of Jesus who believed all human beings ought to be trained in logic and reason so that all human be beings will be able to reflect the love of the Lord to this world. Unbelievable, 92%, which means 126 out of the first 138 colleges and universities, Christian, started by followers of Jesus for the purpose of that. And so whether you agree with it or not, faith was never understood by the people who engaged it in it to be opposed to reason, but rather that our faith should be tested by reason. Did y'all hear what I've said on this? This is huge that you understand this, this simple thing. So that's misconception number one. Misconception number two, you can't believe in science and believe in God. You can't believe in science and believe in God. The idea behind it is that just people back then, they just didn't know how to, how to, how to explain things. And so when they, they heard thunder, they would say, well, that's, that's literally just the God Zeus. They didn't know why the sun uh, appears to go from one side of the sky all the way to the other. And so they would say it, it was the god Helios and his, his chariot going across the sky. And so the, the, the whole idea that science is the only grounds, the only place for claims of knowledge. And so there, there's, there's a, a great problem with that is there's a lot of really great questions and critical questions that science can't answer. You know, for example, you know, do people have equal worth? Science can't answer that. Science can't give us an answer to that. Is a hope more valid than despair? Is there purpose of life? And so the claim that science is the only arbiter, the only source of knowledge, 
is in fact not a scientific claim. It's not built on science. It's not based there. It's a claim of faith. The science is the only one. That's a claim of faith because it hadn't been proven. Hadn't been shown out. It's just there. And maybe the ultimate mystery is how come there is something instead of nothing? I mean, why is there something that's here instead of nothing? And it turns out science can't answer that question. A group of scientists, they, they came before God and they, they said, we want to have a contest. We want to have a man-making contest with you, God, because we don't need you anymore. And, and said, so, can we have the test? Can we be put to the test? And God says, sure, I'm up for the test. Let's do it. And so the scientists, they said, okay, we can do it. We can, we can clone. We can do all these things. And so the, the scientists reached down and scooped up a scoop of dirt and was ready to start his project of creating a man. And God said, uh-uh, hold up. You get your own dirt. <laughs> See, the biggest question why is there something instead of nothing? Anybody home with me? I mean, this is huge when you look at it. Some people think Christianity is irrational because it, it, we believe in miracles. We just got through celebrating the birth of Jesus, the virgin birth of Jesus. We celebrate the resurrection from the dead. I mean, it's, it's all about that. But, but, but listen, People will tell you science has proven those things to be false. Well, you show me the proof. You show me scientific evidence opposed to those. There is none. Scientists will make many claims of faith but never show you evidence. See, evidence always demands a verdict. I, I'll be the first in line to say, hey, I'm with you. But listen, we've got to follow the, the, the facts, and so faith from a Christian perspective is not belief without evidence. It's not belief without evidence. It's commitment without half-heartedness. Somebody needs to sit up and listen on this one. It's commitment without half-heartedness, but it's based precisely on knowledge of God and God's way. And this is really important for us to understand today when, when so many people, especially in the realm of politics seem to just cling to beliefs based on very strong emotions. You know, this is just what I believe, but throughout his, the history of the church, it has been great thinkers who have given the church its most important directions, and precisely because knowing reality matters so much that restricting knowledge to the scientific method only, man, it's dangerous. It's not wise. You know, one scholar, a philosopher named Ed Fesser, he writes that if it would be like saying because a metal detector has had great success at finding metal objects, you know, rings and jewelry and, and, and things of that such, that, that we could say, we could make a declaration that, listen, a metal detector is the source of finding all things and all things can be found. But, but that would be false because he says it won't find tennis balls buried in the sand. It won't find a scarf or a towel buried in the sand. It, that doesn't mean they don't exist, right? It just means that the metal detector can detect only what it was made to detect. Folks, let me just tell you, that's the way science is. Science can only detect what it was formed to detect. What it, it, it builds it. Francis Collins, who, who was the head of the Human Genome Project and then now heads up the National Institute of Health, says one of the most, he's one of the most recognized scientists. He says science, he's also a follower of Jesus, by the way. Listen, he says science is the only reliable way to understand the natural world, but it's powerless to answer questions such as what is the meaning of human existence. We need to bring all the power of both scientific and spiritual perspectives to bear and, uh, and understanding on what is both seen and unseen. Folks, can I just tell you, Christians, of all people, we have an obligation. We have an obligation to, 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 to literally look at truth wherever it comes from, from all sciences, from all fields, from all ways of study, and not to be afraid of it. Man, I, I, I watch so many of my Christian brothers and sisters, we cower in fear, we run in fear from any kind of science, any kind of truth. No, the truth is our friend, always. Always. 
100% of the time. And, and the last thing Jesus would ever do is don't read that. Don't look at that. Don't consider that. I, I think that's, that's, that's false. That's operating in fear. And sometimes churches, we do that. Sometimes that's exactly what we do. But Jesus believed deeply in truth. And third misconception is no one, no one can really know moral truth or spiritual truth. No one. And, and what meaning, so agnosticism and skepticism is the best response or the best posture. But often in our day, faith is just relegated to tradition or preference or uh, opinion, but, but not knowledge. I mean, why is it, why is it the, 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 the theory that's out there is we can know stuff about chemistry and about math, but you can't know stuff about faith and about the spiritual. Why is that? Why can't we use the same logic in looking at these things? It, it just doesn't make sense to me. But, but one of the most important and frequently used words in the Bible is the word knowledge. It's the Greek word gnosis. It, it literally means knowledge, look at this church, not just knowing something, but knowledge based on experience. I've lived it, I've done it, been there. It is one of the most important words. It's the core of Jesus' mission. In fact, one of, one of the passages in Scripture says, if you hold to my teaching, in other words, if you do what I say, right, based on experience, right, it says, you will know, you, you're really my disciples, and then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Do you realize that phrase is the number one phrase, not even close to what's inscribed on the walls of our colleges and our universities in any other phrase. You will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. It'll set you free. It, it's kind of interesting to me. And, and whether you think Jesus are right or wrong, I, I want you just to hear me. He claimed to know. He claimed to know that the way to life and joy and peace was in God and the reality of knowing him and experiencing him. And he didn't just give good advice. He, he, he claimed to know that, that God is real, and because of that, I can trust him. The, 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 the good life is being loved and being alive to God, that, the, 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 that I become good when I become immersed in him. Folks, are you are all following me? He claimed it. He, he, he was a, when, when I start to become a student of the word of God and the, the truth of God, that's when I start to come alive. That's when life enters my life. And it's not, this is not just a tradition. This is a body of Christian knowledge, gnosis, based on experience. It's, it, it, it has not been proven untrue. Let me just say that again. Everything that we talk about here at, at, at church, listen, science has never proved one thing untrue. Not one. You know, we, we, we like to put ourselves in an educated realm. Well, let's take that education to it. Where is it proven? Where has it been proven false that it's not true? We base it on Christian knowledge. And Jesus knew that a well-lived life depends on sound knowledge and what matters most. And so, let, let me just hit a couple things real quick. So it, what does it mean to actually know something? What's it mean? And so I'm going to give you two questions, and I want you to help me with this. I want you to think these through with me, and feel free to shout it out if you want to. Can you believe something and be wrong about it? Absolutely. My wife does it all the time. I mean, I mean, <laughs> anyway, I, I won't go there. But of course you can believe something and still be wrong about it. But secondly, how about this? Can you know something and be wrong about it? Can you know something and be wrong about it? No, not by the definition. Not, not by the definition. Based on experience, right? And, and so to know something means I'm representing it. To know something means I'm thinking about it and I'm handling it and I'm, I'm talking about it as it actually is and so for good reason and not just based on lucky guesses, that what it mean, that's what it means to know. And so what, what counts as knowledge is hotly contested 
in our culture. It's, it's, it's fought about knowledge means to have authority. This is important, right? Knowledge means to have authority. And so people are fighting about it because, man, if, if you've got knowledge, that means you've got authority. I mean, you've got something that is there. And, and, and so when we, when we get that, you know, we, we're always worried about somebody imposing their beliefs on us, right? Have you ever thought about it? Listen, you know, don't impose your belief. We've never said to somebody, don't impose what you know. Knowledge. Why? Because when you have knowledge, it doesn't matter whether you believe it or not. Knowledge, reality will impose itself on you. You just take the law of gravity. You could say, I don't believe it. That's not true. Listen, it will impose itself on you. <laughs> right? Truth always is like that. It's always like that. You can't refute it. You can't, it will impose itself. It's authority in, in your life. And so to people in the ancient world, education does not address, the, the, the whole idea that education doesn't address knowledge, that would be crazy to them. They, they, when, when, when they said we should love God with all our heart, our mind, I mean, listen, it would be crazy to them that you would think like that. But, but listen, that's where knowledge is, is most desperately needed. And listen, what, what's happened, and you tell me if I'm wrong, the people that so desperately love knowledge are the ones that, that somehow refuted out of the faith and the spiritual world. They don't want to come and take the same laws, the same truths, and apply it. And because they become the skeptics and the doubters. And listen, all I'm saying is let's apply truth across the board. Right? Let's take truth and look at truth. And, and, and listen, God was like that from the beginning. He said, my people perish for what? For lack of knowledge. They don't know. See, when you know there's authority, there's something powerful to you. Peter says, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge. I mean, it's important. Faith and knowledge are not opposed to one another. The gospel writer Luke said he very carefully investigated his writing so that you may no. I mean, crazy when you start looking at that. Paul said it like this. He says, now we know in part and we see through a glass darkly. I mean, it's kind of clouded. We can't see clearly. Um, a, a biologist by the name of David Barash, he, he wrote a book a couple years ago called Through a Glass Brightly, Through a Glass Brightly, and he was very specifically contrasting Paul's words to his words and basically what he's saying, he's, he's claiming that science now has shown us through a glass brightly what religion through a glass darkly could not show us. Here's a quote from his, from his book. He says, the reality that life in general and our individual life in particular is inherently meaningless. It's meaningless. But if, if life is inherently meaningless, why did he write a book? I mean, think about it. I mean, what's the point? I mean, it's meaningless. It's, it doesn't have a point. And, and I'm just going to give a challenge to our whole church. I want somebody to name me an empirical study where it's peer-reviewed, where, where it's, it's, it's delving in. I don't care what science. I don't want to care what journal. I don't care what, that refutes the claims of Christianity. Name one. You won't find it. It's not there. Everything that's out there, I'll guarantee you, is theories. There's not based on science. It's not based in truth. And that's the part. And so, so some, some so educated man writes something, and listen, there's no scientific fact behind it. And all of a sudden, everybody just cowers and says, oh, there must be something to this. We, and, and people walk away skeptics and doubt it. And, and you're not going to find a word of that and there, there's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start landing, I promise. There's a little phrase that your mom used to use that shows more educational truth than the scientists are using. 
Your mom ever tell you, boy, you know better. Girl, you know better. You shouldn't have lied. You know better. You shouldn't have stole that. You know better. I mean, you could just fill in the blank with anything. Why? Why? You know better. She didn't say you believed better. She didn't say you prefer better. She says you know. You know your mom was exactly right. You know better. See, in our day, often in very well-intended desire to avoid sounding judgmental or arrogant in, 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 in response to people that somehow, some, what, what happens is we see people in, in, the, in the faith community that will raise up and because we don't know, we'll be really dogmatic and authoritarian in how we say things and we come across as religious jerks. Y'all ever met anybody like that? I mean, when we talk about that, this is huge. And the problem, the problem that it's out there is you hear this phrase all the time, it's always wrong to make moral judgments. You ever heard anybody say that? You can't make a moral judgment. It's wrong to make a moral. Do you realize that's a moral judgment itself? It's wrong. They, they refute, it, it refutes its own statement. It doesn't make sense when you start looking at it. And so we... We, we simply can't live and we can't choose to raise children. You can't raise children. You can't raise a decent society and not make moral judgments. You can't have it. I mean, it, it, it just wouldn't work. And so it is possible for us to know something but to deceive ourselves. I wonder how many of us are deceiving ourselves. You know, play tricks with our minds, you know, in ways that enable us to do what we want to do as if we did not know that we really know. You know better. Some, church, look me in the eye. You know better. A am I wrong? The skepticism and the doubt, you know better. I, I, I just challenge you to look at it. You know, Paul was quite brilliant. I think everybody would, would agree with me. He says, for although they knew God, they knew him, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. They had no experiential knowledge of God because they didn't do what he said. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. I mean, your mom was right. You knew better. You knew better. We do know better. And so this week, I want you to just do some honest reflection where your skepticism is, where your doubts are, it's okay to have them. We all have them. That's part of life. But where do you know better? Where do you know better? I mean, come on, this isn't just, I mean, how about, how about in your finances? Where do you know better? You're acting one way, but you know better in your sex life. In your relationships with your husband, your wife, or do you know better? You could, you could take this a million directions, but I'm going to tell you when it comes down to the end of the day, many of you know better. Are you, are you with me on this? I, the looks in your faces tell me you are. You don't, you don't need some preacher to convince you of something. You need to listen to the Holy Spirit of God. You know better. You know better. And do so. Search your heart. Where do you know better? And then the, finally, the fourth misconception is Christianity is about being right. Christianity, man, it's good to be right. It's good to be right. It helps you deal with reality, but it's not the best thing. In fact, it can be a, 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 a quite a dangerous thing. You know, did anybody here ever sit next to the kid in class that was always right? Right? Could have been you, right? I mean, it could have been you. No doubt in my mind, it could have been some of you. But, 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 but listen, one of the amazing things about Jesus, he was always right, always right, and he never made anybody feel bad about it. He could deal with the poorest of the poor, the most uneducated, the, the most outcast, and he always made people feel welcome. Something powerful. Right? It wasn't that his truth didn't cut. It did cut. Still cuts. But yet it was not done in a judgmental way, and I, I just... Do it. It, it, it wasn't that. And one of the reasons why I think Christianity is so powerfully true 
It is it understands the relationship between knowledge and love profoundly. You know, man, it's good to be in the know, but sometimes we're so in the know that we don't know what love is. Am, am, I, am I home with what I'm talking about here? I mean, you can know everything but not love, and man, nobody wants to hear a word you said. Well, the church at Corinth was filled with people that were the smartest guys in the room. I mean, Corinth, that's what they were known for, for their study, for their pursuit, and, and look at it. And, and listen to what Paul wrote to them. <laughs> he says, we know that we, there's that word, no, we know that we all possess knowledge. We all have it. You know, and, and, and they loved it in Corinth. But knowledge does what? It does what? Knowledge puffs up while love does what? Come on, folks, let's say it. Love does what? <laughs> Those who think they know something do not yet know as they ought to know. Oh, man, is that a lesson for our culture. Come on, it, it's a lesson for us. <laughs> you think you know, man, you better look up. But then it says, but whoever loves God is known by God. Anybody want to be known by God? Whoever loves God. <laughs> there was a dad... It was a really, really smart man. Had a little three-year-old. <laughs> Wasn't impressed. Could care less. Oblivious to the fact that I've got a smart dad. And so here's this brilliant man with his three-year-old son. They had to go to the grocery store. And this kid is whining and cranky and getting grouchy and angry and grabbing stuff. And the dad is just freaking out. And, and he, he just leans down. He says, Lucas... It's okay. You're going to get through this. It's going to be okay. Just hang on. We're almost done. Lucas, you're going to make it. And a lady overheard, and she, she leaned over, and she says, I think it's awesome how patient you are with your son. He's, he says, I'm Lucas. <laughs> <laughs> this is Wendell. And he said, the little, little Wendell just kept, angry and going crazy and 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 dad said I didn't know what to do I didn't know what to do and and so I just started singing Wendell kind of goofy he made up a song your daddy loves you I love being your daddy you know every time I look at you I dream of all the great things that God's going to do Wendell, I'll always be your daddy. Nothing you say, nothing you do, Wendell, could make me ever stop loving you. I love you, Wendell. And little Wendell, all of a sudden, his eyes got great big. And folks, he got calm. And he settled back in his dad's arms and just rested there. And the dad took him out to the car, put him in the car seat, just nice and calm, and got in the front and, and, and when he started to go, little Wendell said, Daddy, sing it again. Sing it again, Daddy. Everybody needs to hear that song, don't they? Everybody needs to hear that song sang to them over and over and over again. And, 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 and folks, Richard Foster says, that's the song we were all born to hear. And no other song can take its place. See, God, when we get down to the end of it, folks, isn't going to ask you how much you know. He's going to ask you how much you loved. That's it. That's, 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 that's how it's going to land and fall out, and we're here to show this world God's love. I'm going to ask you to bow your head with me. Father, I, I, I pray that God, right now, that your, your spirit will just enforce and, in, and bring to bear that, God, we can trust you based on truth, based on verified facts that, listen, there's not one thing in, in our faith that, that, that doesn't need to be verified and proven by reason. Let us be those people that, God, because of reason, we love like nothing else. And so, folks, I'm, I'm just going to try to make this as real as I know how to make it. If you're a person in the room that you wrestle with doubts 
and skepticism. But yet when you hear a message like this, it kind of stirs you a little bit that maybe, and listen, I'm, I'm, take, take your step. Ask your question. You know, we, we, we've said from day one in this church that every step towards God is a good one, no matter how small. Sometimes that step is asking a hard question. Man, this, this church, and church, I want you to understand this. If this isn't you, you need to evaluate you. We, we, we're not afraid of questions. Why? Because truth is our friend, always. Science is our friend. Education is our friend. <laughs> because always, through history up to this point, science has never proven one thing of the Bible untrue. Not one. So, Father, help me open my heart that, God, as we start talking about things of faith, that, God, we can see them for what they are. And God, let us hear the song you sing over us, that you love us, that you'll never leave us, that I've got plans for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. God, let us live in a way that people in our community, they can see that, God, that's the kind of God you are. You're amazing. We love you, Father, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, folks, listen, with, I, I just want to echo that part. I love you guys. Um, you know, I, 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 I just th was singing earlier and just thinking about, God, you're so good. <laughs> and, and, and I th thought about how many things I, I have to say to God, man, you're good. You, look what you do, and, and the fact that he gives us a group of people to worship with, it's, it's a proof of a good God. Amen? Amen. Let's, let's, let's let more people this year in on that. Um, let's, let's let our neighbors and our coworkers, let's invite them. Come be a part. Come hang out at our life group. Come, come be a part, and if you're not in those things, if you're not connecting to the life of the church, why don't you let this be the year? It's a great opportunity to do so. Um, if you haven't got a Bible reading card, make sure you grab one on the way out. Love you guys. God bless.